everyone. Good afternoon and welcome to this virtual professional development opportunity hosted by the Maine Department of Education. My name is Joe Schmidt and I'm the social studies specialist for the department. I'm happy to welcome back by popular demand, Peter Picconi, um, who is an award-winning high school teacher out in California, as well as a PBS digital innovator. He's gonna be here today to talk about using video conferencing to connect your classroom to the world at large. I invited Peter back because his first session went so well and there was a lot of feedback about people wanting to know more. Um, I talked with Peter a little bit and Peter said, I think I have another session. I would love to be able to talk about the role of video conferencing. So uh, without any further ado, I'm gonna turn it back over to Peter for his second great session for us today. Wow, Joe, thank you. Thank you for the nice introduction. And Maine teachers, thank you for having me back. Uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to sharing this with you today. Um, you know, as I've mentioned to you before, uh, one of the reasons I share is because as I share, um, it, it ups my game. I don't see how anybody cannot share and then intensely think about what they do and make improvements. So here we have a, a great case in point. Uh, I have been giving a variation of this presentation for a number of years now. I think maybe four years running, three years running. I've written about it. I've presented on it. But to get ready for, for you guys today, I had such a great time with you the last time, and you offered me so many wonderful things that I added to my presentation, uh, you know, especially the, uh, the suggestion about the warm-up activities and the um, uh, would you rather and the story time. Maybe you all remember those. You offered them up. I worked those into my presentation. But for this presentation in particular, um, I have made significant changes just based on what has happened in the last two months. And this, so much of the information that's coming out here today is brand new. Uh, and I'm really going to be curious to see how, what you do with it, how it in any way inspires you. But uh, quickly, for those of you who, um, who do not know me, uh, I teach at San Marino High School. It's a public school about 20 miles uh, northeast, 10 some, 12 miles northeast of downtown Los Angeles, maybe I overstepped the 20 there. Uh, high achieving school, affluent area. I've been there for, for over 30 years. Uh, I speak a lot at conferences. I like to blog. Uh, I have a little podcast. And then in 2018, I, I won this wonderful, I received this wonderful award for, um, at the ISTE conference for what I've done with video conferencing over the years. And uh, basically the concept is to use video conferencing to connect students with the world at large. So the first question I really want to address is, you know, what do I mean by the world at large? And as you can see from the, the final point on this slide, it's really anyone who has anything of value to offer my students. It can be content related, but, but it can also be for other reasons, which I'll get to in just a second. But over the years, uh, names in the textbook, reach out, contact them. My goodness gracious, I'm amazed at how many of them have agreed. Famous names in the textbook to meet with the kids. Names in the news, book authors, museum staff members, cor uh, uh, curators, community leaders. And then students, teachers, admins at my school, and of course at other schools as well. So just anyone who has something of value to offer. Uh, a slide that I've added uh, just recently here is why? You know, why even bother? Um, as we're all getting into this long distance learning era, we're definitely all using video conferencing, tech, Google, Zoom, whatever. But, but why connect students uh, with something other than just teacher and student? And as you can see, there are a whole host of reasons, um, certainly to, to teach the content, but also to reinforce the learning of that content. One that I've really more or less just stumbled on since school shut down March 13th is the power of video conferencing to build rapport, which I define differently than engaging students. I spoke uh, the last time here about work that engages students, basically gets students excited about work. But when I talk about building rapport, something I read on an Edutopia article a, a few years back, a very capable teacher defined rapport as not just the teacher getting to know the students, but then the students also getting to know the teacher. And getting to, to know each other, the, the, the science seems to suggest, is important because when students and teachers get to know each other better and, and they have good rapport, meaning they like what they're seeing in each other, 
uh, then they're more inclined to work harder and work better to produce better products. And I'm finding video conferencing can do that. And I'll, I'll give some examples of that in a little bit. Uh, the other thing is, and, and somebody last time I was here suggested to me that uh, the kind of work that really engages is the kind of work where students are given uh, opportunity to demonstrate a multitude of skills. And I loved that phrase, and I've gone ahead and added it to my presentation, but I've also worked that in here too. I think video conferencing, uh, when you hand it over to the students in certain ways, really gives them a chance to demonstrate or employ various skills, research, writing, especially in the form of questions, if you're gonna do some kind of interview, speaking, listening, um, stability, collaboration, tech, digital media, and so on. And it is a wonderful way to personalize the learning. I've got a great example for you. And I'm going to be very curious to again see how, how this in any way may inspire you and then to find out where you take it from here. I, I want to give you uh, several different examples of how I have used video conferencing to achieve any of the goals that I, that I just mentioned. And this one just from this morning, two hours ago. I have a summer school U.S. history class. We have an African-American principal who is now moving out of the principalship and moving into an assistant superintendent position within our district. And uh, as we were learning in the U.S. history class about slavery and the introduction of slavery into uh, colonial America, we of course transitioned to talk a little bit about the protest. And one of my students asked something along the lines of, I wonder what Dr. Gates thinks about all of this. And I, I couldn't resist, you know, it, it led to a three hour uh, uh, opportunity where I started to teach students how to write questions, then they started to craft the questions, and then it became a giant collaborative of editing and polishing and then deciding who would ask what, and there was an introduction put on it. And I just wanna show you some of the questions. So we just did the interview and we recorded it. Um, I'm gonna give, uh, I've, I've told Dr. Gates, I'd, I'd like him to feel totally comfortable with my sharing it before it goes out, so he's, he's gonna look it over now. But you know, as you can see, these are some really wonderful questions. They did not come easy. Um, I, I only have 17 students in the class, and this is at least three hours of work if you're not counting the fact that we started on one day and then carried it over to the next day, which meant some of the students then continued to write, polish, think, uh, in fact, even as of, as of today, there were two wonderful questions that were thrown in at the very last that I didn't see coming, that the students came up with, and they say, hey, can I ask this? And I went, my goodness gracious, what a great question. But Dr. Gates answered all of these for us. And in the process, uh, what a bit of, of thinking took place. Uh, I loved his answer, who do you blame for all the violence? I've struggled with that question myself. Uh, you could see he struggled with it, and then he finally came out and uh, simply said, I, I blame all human beings um, for, for this one. And I thought that was a pretty interesting question, uh, answer. Um, the one about, do you think there is more racism? I wasn't sure about that question. Uh, he admitted that when he saw this question, he uh, felt himself get nervous and, and anxious about how he would answer that question. He, in fact, owned up at the start of the interview that he was feeling a great deal of anxiety uh, uh, in anticipation of doing this interview. But he ultimately ended up saying that uh, it was a tough question and he would like to think there's less racism, except for the fact that maybe some people are more likely to show it today. But just, there were a number of really great answers. He talked about the fact that he was raised on the East Coast uh, in the South, uh, uh, that he uh, grew up, uh, father was a policeman and grew up in a military family on, the, on the, sorry, great uh, grandfather was a policeman and father was in the military Air Force. So really a, a great experience for the students. If you, here's what I wanna do. If you want your students to interview a, an African American, I would suggest clicking on the link because it's not just the questions. It's the lead in to the interview, and then it's the, the close out to the interview. And the student who I had served in the role of host, um, apparently just last night decided to completely rewrite the outtake and, and didn't, I, I didn't know about it un, until she gave it. And it was so much better 
than what, what had been produced uh, in anticipation of. Just indication of how much the students bought into this and ended up wanting it to become their own. So we interviewed our, our, super, our, our outgoing principal today and then used that interview as the basis for a planned interview with our police chief, John Incontra. Now, Chief Incontra said he's willing to do this. He had wanted to do it last week, uh, but then we ended up having uh, a protest within our community, and uh, that, that, that d delayed things. But you can see we're certainly going to ask him similar questions, and then the students came up with other questions. Um, I love this one. It was a process. It was a whole process, a collaborative. Do you know any Blacks who claimed uh, that they have been treated unfairly by law enforcement officers, and have you ever witnessed any police officers treat Blacks unfairly? Um, do you think the protests will lead to anything better? And what about this $150 million that we're all hearing about cuts in LA, defunding police departments and so on? So I'm just gonna give you a, a few examples. I wanted to, to spend a little bit of time on the Gates and in contra ones because they're timely and because I would love to see even lower grade kids, you know, police, in your community, what that would be like. And if any of you decide to go down this path, please send me uh, either a link to the video or um, send me a, a write-up. FYI, I created this uh, Facebook group with school shutdown. It's called Titans Got Talent. And Titans Got Talent seeks to spotlight the good work of, of any Titan, meaning a uh, student for sure, but teacher, admin, anybody associated with the community. But we also recognize honorary Titans. Uh, and so I, play, I posted to that Facebook page the good work of, of students and teachers elsewhere. I would love to post uh, an interview of, of, of uh, a main student um, on that page. So if you have something, let me know. But in any event, those that is something brand new. Now I don't want to spend too much time going through all of the, the, the interviews that we have done. But as we have, uh, let's see here, Neil, you said you're a, a government teacher, and I wanna kind of speak to some of the specific teachers here. Neil, it, I, I, my guess is you teach the case of Tinker versus Des Moines, if not famous First Amendment case. Um, it's, it's, it's the rule that everybody has to follow in, in public school. When can you hold or limit a, a student's free speech right. And if you have not ever reached out to Mary Beth Tinker, this is a great time. Just tell her I sent you. Um, Mary Beth is more than willing to talk to students. For those of you who don't know the Mary Beth story in the Vietnam War years, um, as a middle school student, her and her brother decided to protest the war by wearing armbands. Uh, with with the little peace insignia on it back to school and they were warned I believe it was over the Christmas holidays They were warned don't bring the armbands to school. They did anyway They were suspended took the case all the way to the Supreme Court and to this very day the rule is not that students uh, Lose their free speech right at the schoolyard gate, but that they can't say anything that will substantially disrupt teaching, learning, and the learning environment with that term substantial disruption open to interpretation and debate. But certainly it is not true as a result of the Mary Beth Tinker case to say that students have no free speech right at school, that we can curtail, can, can curtail that right on any grounds. One of the nice things about the Mary Beth Tinker interview, for those of you that choose to go down that path, is if you ask her the simple question, did you ever receive uh, hate Mail while you were growing up. If you have my slide show and you click, you'll actually see the video here. Uh, she shows this, and then on the back side, there's a little note to her, and she'll talk about what it was like being uh, a middle schooler. It happened as she was a middle schooler, but the decision didn't come down until she graduated from high school. I love taking video conference interviews and then giving my students an opportunity to follow up so it's not just the interview. And in this particular case, um, I'm a big fan of what is called the historic fiction letter where students take on a role 
and, and write a, a, a letter or a diary entry, that just basically places them at a particular point in time. And this past year, I, uh, because of the interview, because of Mary Beth's willingness after the interview to communicate directly, one of my students reached out to her and said, I, I wanna write a historic fiction letter that assumes that I was with you on the day that you received word that you had won your Supreme Court case. And Mary Beth provided her with such insight onto that day, where she was, the ice cream that she was eating, the reporter that came and told her about all of that, that the student wrote that in this beautiful little historic fiction letter. Um, and it's just a fun thing, a fun follow-up. I'm gonna show you a few more. But uh, Neil, if you go down that path, and uh, Lane, I don't know if that would work in a global class, but, uh, well, I'm sorry, what was that? I thought I heard something there. So uh, again, I'm gonna go continue to move on here through a few more. Mickey Nguyen, uh, if you are, ever watch anything, any video clip in class, PBS, anything, and, and you see a narrator uh, describe a scene, um, we, I teach the Vietnam War, and PBS came out with this award-winning film called Last Days in Vietnam, and somewhere in the video it talked about uh, Ba Van Nguyen, this uh, South Vietnamese helicopter pilot, who in the closing days of the war, he had learned and been trained to fly American Chinooks. And uh, as the North Vietnamese were coming into Saigon, he simply picked up his entire family, newborn baby and all, grandmother and all, put him aboard this Chinook and took it out to sea. There was no place else to land, he took it out to sea. And some miles off the coast, uh, he found a, a, an American ship. It wasn't an aircraft carrier and the Chinook had it landed on the back of the, the ship. It would have sunk the ship, but he was running out of gas. And so in this video clip narrated by his son, Mickey, um, he decides to dump his family in the water. He hovers right above the water, dumps up the entire family, including the babies. They all, one by one, they jump out. And then uh, miraculously, he brings the giant Chinook just inches off the water, comes out of dresses, undresses from his flight suit, turns the rotor to the right, the entire helicopter blows up a million pieces as a blade at the water survives. But I had, and here's the clip if you want to see it, pretty powerful little clip. But when I showed that, I had a, a girl in the class by, by the name of Natalie Lortz. And Natalie, after, it was, uh, after I showed the clip, she explained to me how her mother had, um, had, uh, had to flee South Vietnam under similar circumstances, but was a boat refugee. And Natalie said she would love to talk to Mickey. And so um, I, I encourage my students to write these outreach letters. I've got a template for you in a little while. Uh, Natalie found Mickey on Twitter, of all things wrote him the outreach letter, and the next thing you know, it's Natalie who is hosting the interview. It's not me, but it's Natalie, and that's as much as possible when I'll be talking about this. I like to get the students to, to do an interview. I don't just want the person to talk. I find that doesn't usually work very well. I want them specifically responding to questions that have been produced in advance with one of the students hosting, and that's certainly what we did with the uh, John Encontro, what we're gonna do with the John Encontro video and what we did with the Dr. Gates video. It's all uh, basically student run. I, today, I just sat back and watched. I, if you watch the video, you don't even hear me. You don't even see me. I'm not doing anything. Um, another nice thing I like to do with video conferencing technology is to connect my students with uh, students at other, school, other schools. Uh, I've done this many times. I don't know why I enjoy this, uh, but, but to see students communicating with students from other schools, I think it requires the kids to pick up their game a little bit. They tend to, to, to work at their position, what their, the expression of their position a little bit more. But I have a good friend at John F. Kent High School in Granada Hills, Dr. Scott Petrie, very talented. I, I think, Joe, you know him. And uh, in the election, 2016, uh, we had our students discuss this question of uh, whether America should build a wall along its, its border with Mexico. And so uh, Scott has a very nice and formal way to, for students to discuss uh, difficult issues, and he structures it and he organizes it. And uh, then we, we, we recorded the whole thing on, um, on Zoom. This is Zoom. 
this is something relatively new for me, despite all the years of talking about this, um, using video conferencing technology to help students learn what they need to learn when they are wanting to do some kind of research project. Uh, they are so accustomed to thinking that the internet is where they go to find the answers to all questions. And for sure, the internet can take you a long, long way. But, but one thing is for certain, the detail, the stories, the, the kind of stories that really make a difference that you want to listen to, um, people don't usually put those kind, that kind of information up on the YouTube, why, uh, up onto the internet. And why not? Well, the answer is because it's there for free. And if I have that kind of information, if I'm that kind of a researcher, then I, then I want to be paid for bringing that story forward. Museum curators oftentimes have access to those wonderful stories. And here I had a group of students, and they wanted to do a, a whiteboard animation on the Sultana steamboat disaster. And they worked so hard on trying to get the story, what really happened. But honestly, everywhere they went on the internet led to disaster. They could not tell me the story in a way that made any sense. And, and I grew frustrated. And I said, hey guys, look, let's just call up. Is there even a, a Sultana Disaster Museum? And of course there was. And before you know it, they're talking to the director. And the director is magnificently walking them down the path of exactly what they needed to know. And then they turned it into this very nice, um, what is it, four minute, three and a half minute Sultana Steamboat Disaster whiteboard animation. And he made some great suggestions. He said, look, if you're going to tell this story, don't just start and then stop with the steamboat. You know, talk about why this was important. Talk about how this compared to other uh, U.S. maritime disasters. Talk about what everybody's going to want to wonder about. How did this compare to the Titanic? And so my point is that when the students reached out to this guy, it so kicked up the, uh, the quality of, of this project. Uh, it was stunning. And I happened to be sitting right there when they did it. And I could hear it all. I thought, wow, I'm going to have to work this into my presentation. Um, it, you have the slides. I'm going to suggest, just because they did such a nice job, click on or maybe we can show it. If someone wants to ask for that in the, in the q and I'll be glad to show it then. Uh, fun side story, Donald Segretti, former uh, San Marino High School student, um, politely he's referred to as a political operative. This is the guy who ran Richard Nixon's Dirty Tricks program. For any of you who are Watergate fans, uh, Donald Segretti's work will immediately conjure up the F word. The, there's a famous use of the F word. Uh, in terms of this, if you look him up on Wikipedia, I think it's in the first paragraph. Uh, Donald went to jail for his involvement in Watergate and never ever had came, came back to San Marino. Uh, one day I was sitting around with a board member and he mentioned that Donald had, had gone to San Marino and, and he knew my work. He knew what I do with video conferences. He, he, he said, have you ever tried reaching out to him? I said, no, I haven't. So I did. And the next thing you know, um, we brought him in. We asked him questions like, uh, you know, what was the lesson that you took away from Watergate? Do you think Ford should have pardoned Nixon? Uh, do you think Nixon was a good president? Um, do you have anything to say about our current president? Here is a, a picture of, of Donald Segretti from, from his home and the two students who hosted that interview. And again, it's always the same. Uh, you know, it, it's, I don't want to be center stage. I want the students to create the questions. I want the students to run the interview. I want these students then to turn to other students later on and say, do you have any questions? But Donald so enjoyed this experience that he then agreed to come to San Marino. First time he'd been back to San Marino since he graduated. And there he is sitting at my desk. That's a picture of my daughter uh, and my son uh, over, his left sh over his right shoulder on your left side. And, um, and, and uh, it turned into a newspaper story. Again, the entire appearance, all, all student run here. 
I said to you earlier, video conferencing can be used just to build rapport. I think I spoke to you the last time I was here about um, rainy day activities, engaging students, re-envisioning the uh, office hour concept. Um, Patrick agreed to play his guitar from his studio in his home. I just realized that's his exercise bike there. But uh, what a nice moment that was. And I think if you click on it, you can actually hear him do one of the ACDC songs. I'm not the biggest ACDC fan, but just using video conferencing technology in a, in a little different way. Are you all familiar with this picture here? This photograph that, I, that I'm showing? Does anybody recognize that photograph? Officially, that is called Joy. It's one of those iconic Vietnam War photographs that every teacher shows year in, year out. I've been teaching 30 years. I can't tell you how often I've shown that picture. And then just about five years ago, and again, I had this reputation for, for, for video conferencing, but sometimes it just doesn't dawn on me. One of the students said, well, um, any of these guys still alive? And I said, I don't know, but now that you mention it, I know what you're thinking, so let's look it up. And, and so they found Lynn Spicard. They found the, the, the girl there uh, with her arms wide open. She's a teenager, that's her father. He's a POW coming home from the war. And uh, the question was, well, what do you guys want to know about the photograph? Well, obviously, we want to know the story leading up, and we want to know what happened afterwards. You know, did, did the marriage survive the POW years? What was it like to be uh, with your father? How traumatized was he? And so uh, you take a look at the faces of the kids on that day, um, you know, kind of a serious look there but they were certainly interested. Um, once in a while, students, uh, especially in a government class, a civics class, if, if uh, you, you give them the opportunity, they're gonna wanna do a civic action project. In other words, take steps to affect policy, bring about some kind of rule change. And uh, the, 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 it's, it's not that I support the rule, but what do you do when the students say, I wanna try to see a rule change that you don't support and they need to find out how to take the steps to support that rule. I had a group of students one year who decided that the phrase under God, in their opinion, violated the, um, the uh, First Amendment uh, exercise clause, and the sorry, First Amendment establishment clause, a government teacher, and I drew a blank there for a second. And they wanted to know what are some of the arguments in favor of that. And they did some research. They found Michael Newdow, um, famous case here, California. Um, they contacted him and the next thing you know, he's, he's talking to him. Now, obviously they didn't get very far with this, but just another use of video conferencing technology. Um, and I'm amazed, the reason I put this one in here is, is what I'm amazed is when students reach out, um, and especially if they have a good angle, if it's not the kind of thing where you just say, go look at the internet, you can find the answer there. I am amazed at how many people will give students a video conferencing opportunity. Here, the superintendent of, of education, California, Tom Torlox, and why? Well, because this, I had a group of students who were thinking about a, a new civic learning class. And so, as you can see, Michael Newdow, the questions that he's gonna answer, the questions Lynn Spicard is gonna answer, the question that Donald Segretti is gonna answer, these are not going to be available on the internet. And when you bring two individuals, even individuals in the news, even individuals that, that uh, have as much uh, esteem as Judge Judith McConnell, the presiding justice of the fourth district here in the California Appellate Court, they will appear before the kids uh, because they know that, that this is a unique opportunity, that, this, that what they have to say is not on the internet. Um, I worked with an organization a few years back to create a, a learning opportunity for students, uh, basically a, a mock U.S. Supreme Court hearing that, um, where the question was, should Sikhs, which I believe we today pronounce six, I've been told, whether they, uh, schools, a uh, school rule that prohibited, prohibits six from using school children from bringing to school a kirpan, which is a, a knife of sorts used in their religious ceremonies. Um, would that rule violate the school children's right to practice their religion freely? 
So the interesting story here is we, of course, wanted a Supreme Court judge to video conference with us and, and see what he would say. So we sent it off to every one of the Supreme Court judges an outreach, will you do this? And surprisingly, um, we did get a letter back. We got a letter back from, from Anthony Kennedy. And that letter today hangs in my classroom, which I haven't seen in three months. But uh, Anthony commented on how he would love to do this and what a great opportunity this would be for students, but unfortunately he couldn't do it. So we reached out, I'm sorry, uh, Judge McConnell, if that places the priority there, but reached out to Judge McConnell and she sure enough agreed. Students got all dressed up. This is one of my epic fails though, to be honest with you. Um, I learned a lesson here. I, look, look, these kids were all ready. Judge McConnell was all ready. And um, to be honest, I didn't do my homework. Uh, I did not have a tech guy in the room that day to guarantee that if things went down, um, uh, that he would be able to help me fix it. And the audio, uh, because we, we, what we, we used this room instead of my room because I, I wanted the visual for the photograph. And the audio was a disaster. Um, if you're looking over there in the right-hand corner, that's our local newspaper man wanting to cover the story. And the, the audio didn't work properly. And Justice McConnell, I, 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 she let me know it too. She, she let me know as a judge would, would let somebody know, you know, don't come waste my time, do your homework. Um, and I'm getting hot behind the neck just just remembering that instance. But in, in the end, it turned out to be a, a great learning. You know, she she did, she worked it through, but it was very frustrating for her, and I totally understand. And it changed the way I, I get ready for video conferences in, in the future. My government students one day told me they read a story in the New York Times about a, um, a city in Maryland, town in Maryland, that had just given 16 and 17 year olds the right to vote. I do teach government, I do allow students to do civic action projects. They thought, well, this would be a great civic action project. How do you, whoops, sorry, how do you find out about the ins and outs of, of this kind of a law? Well, you contact uh, the city council member who, who spearheaded this, voted in favor of it, and he gave the, the students a step-by-step. -step. No, it didn't pass in our town, but it sure did make for an interesting semester, uh, especially watching them make the presentation. That was kind of cool. I've got a couple slides here. I, I don't hesitate to reach out to, to teachers who can do a better job teaching something that I can. Christina Fahad teaches mock trial down the road. Um, I know she does a great job with the hearsay, hearsay rule. I don't do a great job with it. She just knows how to talk to kids so kids will listen, listen so kids will talk. She did a one. And then the very famous Adam Norris, I don't know if you know Adam, but quite an accomplished AP US history teacher. I uh, can't do better than to have him come in and, and, and help prep your kids before the exam does real nice work. Um, one of the more interesting video conferences, I've just got three left, and then I'm going to turn it over to some questions here, but uh, Joshua Wong, I don't know if you guys know Joshua, but uh, right around the age of 18, Joshua is the guy that brought a quarter million people to the streets of Hong Kong in what is called the Umbrella Movement. There is Joshua Wong. He was put on cover of the Time Magazine, and I have a large Chinese population. Population, but to be honest with you, uh, a, a Chinese population that, to a large extent, uh, it struggles with Joshua Wong um, because of what he's trying to do in Hong Kong. And so um, it's not as if I could say that, that that population is big fans of this young man, but there was a student who was, and we reached out to him, and the next thing you know, Joshua Wong appeared before the students. Um, but this was a difficult one. I, I have to be honest with you. You know, Joshua went to jail a short time after this, and uh, no sooner did he get out, uh, he said some 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 pretty sharp things. I don't think I think they were literally walking him out, and he said some sharp sharp things, and they sent him back again. Um, and of course, now we see China uh, having uh, taken some pretty severe action in Hong Kong. So, not really sure what happened, but it was quite a story to follow for a while. There are the students with the lights turned on asking him a question. And so um, I'm going to tell this one. I forgot that this was on here. Uh, if I can't reach someone because of video conferencing, it won't work or whatever. What I learned was have a telephone with a speakerphone handy. Uh, Norman McCorby was all done by speakerphone. 
that is Jane Roe, that is the woman who um, is responsible for the case of Roe v. Wade. It's not called Norma McCordy. That should say, uh, yeah, it, it's not called McCordy versus Wade because if you are going to give your name to a Supreme Court case and it is likely to cause you severe harm or threaten to cause you harm, you can go have your name put on as a pseudonym, uh, Jane Roe for a female, John Roe for a male, Baby Doe, et cetera, Baby Roe. Well, in any event, um, in 19, uh, in, uh, when Arnold Schwarzenegger was the governor here in California, he wanted to see on the ballot a proposition that would require, uh, the, the, nobody could get an abortion unless they presented the doctor with written permission from one of the parents. And uh, of course, you know, that brings to mind the case of Roe v. Wade and, and would that rule violate the Supreme Court decision in Roe v. Wade, et cetera, et cetera. Um, typically, this is how it happens. Um, you know, one of my students says, well, you know, who's Roe v. Wade? So I tell a little story and then they ask the question. And the question was uh, to get this case to court, she, she was pregnant. It takes four to five years on average to, to have the court uh, go from argument to decision. That's what it took in, in her case. So she had the child and that child was given up for adoption. The question was, have you ever been reunited or wanted to be re reunited with the child that you gave up for adoption? We had the whole thing set up. And uh, again, one of my students found her online in the early days of, of the internet. Um, and when it came to this question, for some reason, she hadn't been prepped that this question was going to be asked. She absolutely unleashed. And um, how dare you ask me this question? This is such an unfair question. I didn't think this question was coming. And she hung up. And a few minutes later, her spokesperson called up and said, hey, that was a great question. I invite you and your students to ask her that question anytime. Just give her a chance to cool down and maybe come back at it next year. But to be honest, I never did. Um, just, just never did. I let it go. And then, of course, uh, Norman McCorby died a few years back. Here's something fun, another way to use video conferencing technology. Uh, I have a, a teacher at the school, a fellow social studies teacher, Andrew Gale. Together, we decided when I created uh, Titans Got Talent to also create something called Titan Talk, basically a podcast. We co-host it. And uh, our, our story is we're going to interview anybody who has uh, anything of value to offer um, at all, a teacher, a student, admin. And as schools shut down, uh, we used video conferencing tech to interview a couple of students who had some nice stories. Craig McLaren Swan here rebuilding a Mazda Miata um, in his garage. And then Calvin Ryan here um, had gone to work at in and out and both of them turned into very nice little interviews, but just a different way to use the tech. So I'm going to stop right here with the exception of saying this. Um, I don't think I need, my guess is you all experienced enough to know the, the best for best results, how to, to go about that. But I, I would just strongly suggest, and I didn't put it here for a reason is making sure your tech guys are on board before so that they they're, they're right there with you one way or another i've run into problems with that where just something didn't work right and when a board member is in the room or the superintendent is in the room because sometimes these have real high interest like donald segretti if they don't work right i mean i'm remembering one time i, I again i hadn't learned the, the lesson yet i'm a little slow but i did have the board president in the room and the, the tech didn't work. Well, fortunately, when you have the board president in the room, he makes a telephone call and 30 seconds later, everything gets done just the way it was supposed to. But had he not have been in the room, that would have been another epic fail. So I, I said I was going to stop right here. Um, the third grader teachers, the sixth graders, the first graders, I do have something for you. And maybe we could just get there quickly. Um, but I'm thinking I was going to go right to you right now, but let me just continue on here um, and then see if we can't tie back to that. Um, how do I find people to connect to? Well, it's, you know, 
Facebook. I, I do find a lot on Twitter. For those of you who are not on Twitter, um, I'm going to ask you to consider it. I was not a big Twitter fan. And then I have become a big Twitter fan, so much so that I wrote an article four years ago on how and why I became a teacher Twitter convert. Uh, but when I go to the question, I'm going to be curious how many of you are on Twitter. I do find the New York Times to be a good source, LA Times, Wall Street Journal, and so on to be a good source for um, people to contact. Word of mouth, obviously, always. And then here is something new for y'all. Um, uh, the Center for Interactive Learning and Collaboration, especially if you're looking for field trips or the, the mystery Skype concept. A friend of mine, Jan Zanettis, uh, runs this thing. I've got her email address for you at the end. Uh, I'm gonna ask you in just a moment, how many of you ever heard of CILC or, or used it? So here is my student outreach letter. We can come back and look at that in a moment if you'd like. Um, but I really want to try to get to a, a little bit more interactive here. Here for best results, uh, I prefer Zoom and Google Meet. I go back and forth between the two. I did Google Meet today, but we used Zoom about a week ago. And uh, then just the formatting instructions, which is interview formatted. Uh, get the students together, have them do their research, have them draft up their questions, then work with the students. Teach them how to write good questions. And then actually create some questions of your own and let them review and edit those, giving the class a big say in not only the order of questions to be asked, but also what questions are to be asked. And when it comes to asking good questions, I mean, there are some basic rules that I really like to, to emphasize. Uh, no compound questions, in other words, no, no, no questions that have the conjunction and. We're not asking two questions at one time. Uh, no leading questions, questions where the answer, the student's answer is already in the question, and no gotcha questions. Uh, I tell the kids, you are not um, Woodward and Bernstein, Washington Post, Watergate years, uh, and you're certainly not the Washington DC press, uh, uh, press corps. Um, and then I do encourage them, and this is where the research comes in real handy, a few how do you respond to those who say. So find a great line on the internet and then turn that into a question. For those of you who would like more, uh, these are three very good articles on question writing, one from Lumen Learning, one from StoryCorps, and then one from Edutopia. Uh, I do want to ask you if you are familiar with Edutopia. Um, I find that there is just great, great stuff up there for teachers. A little closeout that we could read here in a moment, and this is the fun part. This is where I want to go to. Uh, your turn. So I want to hear from you, but before we get there, I'd like to all to introduce you all to, to a wonderful team of support. Reach out to any of these people. Kindergarten teachers, first grade, second grade, third grade, reach out to Amy Rosenstein. Amy is an elementary school teacher who, uh, if you look up her name and you look up the letters K, Q, E, D, you'll see that, uh, that Amy uh, has written a, a number of nice stories for the KQED website on how she uses uh, video conferencing tech um, in her elementary grades. Um, and I'm, I'm a big fan of what she does. Ralph here and uh, Sean, both very experienced teachers. Uh, Sean was the 2017, he, he got the award in the year before me. Um, and please don't hesitate to reach out to Jan, who runs the Center for Interactive Learning uh, check out the website. Uh, an amazing list of, of opportunities there for, for students. So what I'd like to do here, and, and that is to go back to it's your turn. How many of you, first off, um, have a good story for us here? How many have used it in any way, uh, even if it is an epic fail? And how many of you uh, is there anyone here who is planning on using or has an idea based on the presentation today? 
Um, I, I guess I have a, a quick one. Um, over the summers for a few years, I worked with Iraqi students doing cultural exchanges in the United States. So mm -hmm. when we would come to world religions, um, I had a few students who were very excited to speak to students I had in the U.S. about Islam. So I was able to have situations where the, you know, the students created uh, questions and were able to ask um, my student about Iraq in general, but then also uh, about their religious practices. Neil, when, uh, uh, if you have multiple classes, the same classes, right? What do you do in that case um, to make sure, I mean, if you're gonna, nobody wants to come for be three, four classes in a row, right? So you do one, how do you get the information to your other classes or how do you handle that? Or have you thought about that? Uh, that was one where I was teaching only one section um, of a class, so I didn't, I didn't run into it. Um, but I would like to hear kind of advice on, on how to best incorporate multiple classes if there's only one slot with one presenter. I have a, a good teacher friend who doesn't hesitate to challenge me. <laughs> and uh, for years, he stayed after me saying, uh, Peter, it's just not fair to those other classes when you do this in one period and then then what and and obviously recording is uh, one way to go but but the recording sometimes just is that doesn't quite work well because the students in the other class want to be more engaged they don't want to just sit back and and watch and so it was a long-standing frustration of mine but ultimately what i found was uh, having a student write it up and either blog about it or turn it into an article for the local uh, school paper or for the local paper um, was, was, was nice. It was an, another nice way to, to get those out. I have a few examples of that, but uh, as often as possible. Now, I didn't do it today, and I, I wish I would have. I should have done it today with, um, with, with Dr. Gates. Uh, missed opportunity there, but I wish I would have had someone from the school paper last year come in and, and write this one up. Jen, sorry, Neil. Yeah. Jen, are you? Sorry, Neil. Sorry, what? <laughs> sorry, I was just saying thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah. Jen, have you experimented in trying to connect your third graders with with anybody? I, I wouldn't really call it video conferencing, but during this remote learning, I had a mystery reader, and um, I had them come up with questions. So some of them asked like, where was my mystery reader from? And how old was my mystery reader? I mean, they are third grade. Um, if, and they did, so th my mystery reader wasn't on screen. So they had to try and figure out who they were, where they were from, how they were related to me or to our class. Um, they came up with some really great questions on the fly with something that they've never, um, so my mystery reader was Leslie. So, she can vouch that they had some really great questions for have never like not experiencing this before and then she read them a story and then stayed to chat with them and it was it was a great experience for them so this would be something that I think third grade could definitely handle I've always wanted to do the mystery Skype with another classroom especially where um, you know definitely social studies comes involved where they have to try and figure out the location of that other classroom using coordinates and location and um so i think i think it would be a great thing to go into further because they can definitely handle it you know I, I i'm thinking again and talking to you guys so i had a q a at the end of my last slide show i'm going to add one to this one um you know i didn't even mention mystery skype uh and, and that uh, I don't know anything about mysteries. I've heard that term, but I know nothing about it. I don't, is there a, I need to include that information in here. And the other thing, your uh, mystery reader, I've definitely never heard of that. If there, is there a good article that describes to other teachers how to do that? I'd love to include that in this slideshow. Jen so and I'll I, write it. We'll write it. <laughs> Jen. Yeah, we'll help you write it. Um, I, get, I don't really know much about it. I know my school does it. And um, we have mystery readers. They're just people from the community that come in. Um, 
and the kids have to ask questions and they have to try and figure out who it is. And sometimes it's just the principal or it's just a parent or, but our social studies curriculum is, is community, it's loaded with community. Um, so that's, that's more so kindergarten, first and second grade. And we really break away from that in third grade, but because we were doing remote and all pretty much zoom, I, I have a strong sense of community in my classroom. So I still wanted to do that, but I wanted to introduce them to somebody new and try and get more kids connected to my zoom sessions. So once I said that we were going to have a mystery reader, I had a lot of attendance that day. Wow. Yeah. Uh, did you say you would be willing to write something? <laughs> well, <laughs> can uh, I? We could try. We're, we're calling it mystery reader, but it's not from any pedagogy, Peter. It's just what we called it. Well, great. I mean, um, I, you know, this help. I, we're learning all the time. As, as you are talking here, um, I'm thinking my outgoing principal that we interviewed today, he has three children. He has an 18 year old. <laughs> He has an 18-year-old, an a, a eight-year-old, and a five-year-old. And one of the questions that one of the students asked was, what are you telling your kids about the protests? And he said, well, it depends on the, the age level of the kid. He was telling his 18-year-old, don't go anywhere near the protest. But he was telling his five-year-old that not all police officers are bad. So as you were talking here, I was thinking, wow, for the younger kids in particular to, to video conference with the PD, and to learn that lesson, uh, you know, that, that might be pretty powerful in and of itself. And they could even be like a mystery reader to read a book right. about what they do and their job. And like, because we have um, re uh, resource officers that are in our school mm -hmm. for that very same reason. So our students grow up knowing that a police officer is a safe person to go to. They're not always bad. And we don't use like, you know, you often, I hate when parents do this, but like, sorry, if you do something bad, the cops are going to arrest you. Gotcha. Yeah. Any, anybody else um, have a experience with? Uh, I do, uh, Peter. No? We, I had my sixth graders, not this school year, but the year before, they had an opportunity to talk with and confer on video conference with an honor flight veteran and that was they got to talk with him before and just kind of get to know him a little bit uh and ask him about what he was going to be excited about and then he came back again and did a follow-up with the kids after his honor flight and that was so much more meaningful they had established even just a general relationship and he got so emotional talking to the children about his visit down in dc it was so great to see these you know 11 and 12 year olds get jonesed up and excited talking to this 90 plus year old man who had made that journey and it, it's they then wrote letters to him and they've had an established rapport now and we exchange letters with them every veterans day very nice very nice Andrew Gale, my co-host on Titan Talk, uh, presented a thought to me the other day, and <clears throat> it's a powerful thought. He, he is really supportive of this interviewing people on video conference, turning it into a podcast, basically. But, but he said, we, we, we need to focus more on, on locals because as school districts are, uh, one, uh, struggling for funding, and Two, um, if we don't tell our own story, others will, and it may not be in the most positive light. This is a great way to bring out all the good that is happening within a school um, in, in ways that the local paper, it just isn't going to do. So um, I just thought I'd, I'd bring that up, but he's got me thinking about that. Um, Karen, first grade teacher, um, do you, have you used it to connect your students with anybody other than uh, with the class? First grade? Is Karen there? No, Jessica? Ele the uh, elementary, um, do we have Jess there? Hi, yes, I'm here. Um, I haven't used it personally, but I would 
like to if I have the opportunity in the future. And I had a few ideas as you were going through your presentation. Um, one thing that came up when you were talking about Vietnam, I was thinking of my husband's second cousin, David Thomas. He, um, he served over in Vietnam and then afterwards he was involved in the um, veterans protests against war. And then he created um, an Indochina arts project, which became a partnership. And then um, he's helped to like develop the relations between the US and Vietnam and through art. And he spends a lot of time there and here and has students come here to Maine to learn. And I thought it would be, he would be a great person to interview and also thinking about our local police chief has been very involved and has put out messages to our community. We have here in Maine, um, we're pretty diverse in Westbrook other than, you know, besides the rest of the country. And she's very, um, you know, an advocate for making sure that our population feels safe and welcome. I think it would be great to have her talk with students personally and get that message through and it'd be great to have some of our immigrants share some of their personal experiences and <clears throat> a lot of them were professionals in their countries and they'd love to share their expertise here with uh, students and the general population those are just some ideas that I had that might be great to bring those into the classrooms or through the Skype or Google Classroom for the children to ask mm -hmm. questions and interview. Mm -hmm. um, also I'm elderly sorry. people, we have a lot of elderly people that I'm sure they would love to share their stories. And unfortunately today there aren't too many, um, you know, big families, they're all little nuclear families and they don't have much involvement for the, with the older population. It's great to have them involved and bring them in so the students can learn from them also. Yeah. The, ol the only thing that I definitely um, would encourage or discourage is um, I've been bringing people into the room for years, my school for years. They haven't insisted on this. If you if you bring in one person who says this, you have to bring in somebody that says the opposite. They know that uh, over time, the accumulation has been a balance of both sides of, of issues. But um, if you just bring somebody in to talk, I have found that that typically doesn't work very well. Uh, students want to engage. We, we, we live in an age of engagement. They want it be. They want it to be interactive. They don't just want to be talked to. Um, on the other, so, so I, I think the question answer format is really important for students, but it does take work. That's the problem. You know, we, we spend time working on the questions, uh, and yet I believe it's such an important skill that, that it's worth the effort. Um, on the other hand, my, my wife said to me as uh, she was passing through the hallway when we were doing the questions, she said, you didn't sound like you taught much history today because she'd been passing back and forth. He said, you spent a lot of time on teaching questions. And she said, you're gonna get in trouble for that? So yeah, it goes that way. Are any of you from, are any of you from, I'm sorry, uh, Leslie, was that a question? No, I just wanted to piggyback on what you said. I know sixth graders, a lot of times if we talk to um, law enforcement personnel, they wanna get that question out there, you know, have you ever fired your gun? Have you ever shot somebody? Have you ever killed someone? Have you ever been shot? And really getting them through that is an important coaching experience. Um, and it kind of shows right there that automatic mindset of, of adolescent children, and they want to get to that um, violence and gory kind of part of that job real quick. So I totally agree with you that doing that front loading prep is just a key importance for them to, to think beyond that and to think bigger about more important issues. Joe, how many do we have on today? Uh, 14, is that how many? I think you had 14 at the high point. You've got me, you, and seven others right now still going. So what I'm curious about is of the eight or nine, um, has no, no, is anybody familiar with CILC by any chance? Mm -hmm. 
All right. And as far as the technology, I hear a lot of you saying Skype. Is that the one of choice? As a, uh, I, I didn't mention that one, but. Yeah, this and Google Meets are what I'm familiar with. Google Meet, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. I used Skype when it was, uh, yeah, outside presenter coming into the classroom. I, I've used Skype. Mm -hmm. Dream for me for a second. Pick somebody that would, you'd say, well, I don't know if they would do it. But I, I not only want to hear who it is, but why you, why you would want to try to reach that person, have that person connect with your kids. Dream for a second. Um, you know, the student's favorite book author, or I don't know, just dream and tell me who it would be. Remind me of the name of the little girl um, who went to school when they desegregated, escorted. Ruby Bridges. No, not Ruby. Um, oh, Linda. come on. Lin I think, well, Linda Brown or Ruby Bridges? Maybe I was thinking Linda Brown, but yeah, or Ruby. Yeah, I would love for them to have an opportunity to talk to them. Well, let's make Ruby happen. Let's totally I don't, make Ruby happen. Let's make Ruby happen. <laughs> Somebody. Excited. Let's make that happen. And let's see if that's, let's try that. Um, that both of them do classroom talks. They, they do classroom talks? Yep. How do I not know that you know that, Joe? How does that not come out in 100 days? Because well, we didn't talk about Ruby Bridges or video conferencing. I just know I've seen colleagues or, or I've seen bits and pieces of people. who. <laughs> yeah. Joe, have we ever had Ruby at NCSS or CCSS or anything? Oh, actually, NCSS? I don't think so. Not as one of the featured keynotes. <laughs> you know, um, I wonder if the angle to, well, first of all, here's the thing. Let's get her. But the angle would have to be, we want to ask her something that is different. And obviously, I think something along the lines of what we're seeing with the Gates interview, you know, something other than your story, which we get on uh, on, the, on the movie anyway. Um, but then also, has, has she done it yet with video conferencing? And would she help to, to show, help us to show how that can be done? Uh, imagine the reach if we all, if we could get that video, imagine the reach of her message as opposed to coming into a classroom. Who is going to spearhead this? <laughs> Not it. <laughs> Joe's pretty good at reaching out to people. <laughs> I, was, I was looking at you, Joe. I think uh, Joe's plate's pretty full. Cool. I was actually just, I was waiting for the pause. The one I was going to um, recommend that I actually could help facilitate very easily, um, Neil, um, that um, uh, executive order, no, I'm blinking, executive order, what is it, um, 6099? Nine zero six six internment. Yeah. Who? Um, what's the last name? Fred Korematsu. Korematsu versus United States. His daughter yeah. runs the Fred Korematsu Institute. Um, oh, yeah. and does a lot of work with my national group. She does speaking engagements um, a lot, and she answers. You know, I've told people one of the highlights as um, in my professional career is we hosted her for dinner. And was in San Francisco, they had FDR's old yacht, the floating White House. And so on FDR's yacht, we had Karen Korematsu speak. And she started off by saying, yes, I recognize the irony of me speaking on uh, the floating White House, you know, because it was FDR who issued that order and it was her dad who had sued. But she tells an amazing story. Um, but I was just trying to look up, trying to figure out where I had seen in different things about Ruby Bridges speaking um, or Brown speaking, because I know I, I feel like I've seen those in classrooms already. I'm going to go back to this for a second. I have found this to be a very powerful tool. It isn't just this reaching out, but the student providing a shape and a focus, if not outright indication of the questions that are gonna be asked. So, um, you know, why, 
the student is, is explaining why the class wants to hear from this particular individual. You know, we just, in, in, with the Dr. Gates interview, just finished studying uh, the introduction of slavery into the United States. And we thought that you might have much to offer the class, given the fact that A, you know, you're, you're an African American, and B, uh, you know, that, that the protests today link back to this very period of time that we're studying. And so specifically, we would like uh, to know your answers to the following questions. So there in that paragraph, the student places the questions. And I think that that's the, the key, is making sure, uh, I have literally, uh, one year we went after Hillary Clinton, and you know, uh, the, the spokesperson came back and said, look, you're, just, you're not asking her anything that she wouldn't be, you can't find on the internet. Give us something unique. Give us something that we want to speak to. And that's where I learned that lesson. So I'm curious uh, what questions we would ask Ruby Bridges, what questions we would ask Karen, other than, Karen, tell us the story of your father's Supreme Court case, which she's told 8 million times already. But I think that would be great. I'd love to see Karen. Yeah, I think some things I think about are, you know, what was your day like the day before the decision? Yeah, yeah. And how was it different than, you know, or even before the lawsuit was filed? It was really the compare and contrast of her life, the best she can remember it. The one of the interesting stories about Karen's story, and um, I had, was actually fortunate to have coffee with her one day, but um, Karen's father was was dating somebody at the time, and he was arrested. Uh, when he went to go visit the girl. And uh, the girl, if I remember correctly, well, I, I do remember correctly, the girl was not Japanese, the girl was white. So Karen's uh, father had decided to stay over against his parents' wishes, not go to the internment camp, and had done a number of things to hide the fact that he was Japanese. And, and, and I think that included an attempt to get some surgery done on his eyes and haircut and so on. But the day that he showed up, the girl wasn't there, and then he got arrested, standing on the street corner waiting for the girl. One of the great mysteries in the family life is what happened on a day. Why didn't he show up? And but not, you know, that that's intensely personal. It's just a, a fun one, though. But I'd be really curious what Karen has to say about the events of today. I'm wondering if she's yet had a chance to come. I wonder if Karen has attended any protests or um, anything like that. I, mean, I don't know if I can speak to today today, um, but just when they did the, I'm um, trying to think of the New York Public Radio, when they did their podcast around, uh, uh, was it a more, more Perfect, their podcast around that, she was interviewed as part of their series because they did a section on Japanese internment. So she continues to respond out and she, um, it was right after I think some of the um, travel bans from different countries and she spoke out about how what are the parallels between what had happened with her father and some of the other stuff. My superintendent uh, wrote an email to all of us last week and and certainly the message of it was um, in no way are we going to tolerate A, B, C, D, and E and uh, you know we definitely believe speaking on behalf of the district his position was you know that uh, a lot had gone wrong in the death of, of, of George Lloyd, um, and can't, this can't be looked past. But the more important part, if you will, was that what did he want us to do? And, and he said, we're gonna recommit ourselves to diversity education. And uh, ever since I saw that, what I'm wondering about is how can video conferencing be used to provide the school district with evidence that we've gone down that path? And, and what you know, could you do to show that in your own little way, you are encouraging diversity education. Um, even, even though I know when I looked that term up on the internet, I didn't find a very good answer for what that thing means, but I'm curious. Again, dream somebody. Uh, let's see if we can dream outside of social studies. Anybody have anybody else, uh, if you could get them to talk to your students and why? Well, it may not uh, 
I, w I would be interested to have my students speak with, and I, I don't know who this would be, but me, a member of, uh, you know, a royal family or a different type of government to uh -huh. explain what the benefits are. Cause I think it'd be interesting for them to hear from someone saying, hey, no, democracy is awful. This is the best way to run a country and how, and kind of see them grapple with that. Be curious to see who your students reach out to, Joe, and what's, uh, Neil, sorry, and what's uh, success? So the, yeah. Well, I, I know uh, when I was in, in Jordan for a little bit uh, that uh, many in their country, oh, yes, uh, this is great. I mean, they have a, a lot of informants. Um, but even, even a country like that, like a, a country like Jordan, which has seen to do relatively well compared to some other uh, monarchies and, and maybe some of the arguments for and against, uh, mm -hmm. even in that area, right? Why do they think it's a good, good, and then see what the students come back with as a response. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like. Anybody else? I always just think about, because I do a lot of read alouds with my class, I always just, like my first go-to is the, the authors of all the books that we read. Like every time we read a book, they're always like, we should write to the author or we should talk to them or we have questions. Um, that's always, I guess that's just my go-to. I can't really think of like off the top of my head right now, who else we could, who they else they'd want to talk to. Um, we do at our school because um, I'm not not sure if you're familiar with Chris Van Dusen. Um, he is, he's an author, illustrator, and he lives in Maine. So he's close by to us. He comes to our school quite often and does um, visits. So I'm sure that's something that if we, during this time, if we had to do it again, he would probably do another visit. Um, but the kids love him because he's, have, I, if you have a chance, you should check him out, look him up. Um, but that's the, that always seems to be like their go-to is the authors and the illustrators of books. I think that's just because that's their world at third yeah. grade. Well, I can imagine if they if if you can get three great questions. Why did you have the uh, the character do this and not that? Or um, you said this, but couldn't that also be true? And, uh, two or three great questions. I'm curious if an author would, would come forward. Um, I haven't, th there have been a couple of book authors. Um, they didn't tend to be very long interviews because the book author always wanted to make sure that the kids read the whole book and that was never quite the case at the high school level. Um, so I haven't had a great deal of success with book authors, though there were a few interesting ones, Jackie Robinson kind of stuff, that was interesting. I wish the museum um, could do more. I, I, at least when I went down that path, we've had experience with it. But when I think of the potential there, uh, I'm, I'm picturing someone in a museum walking, to saying, hey, students saying, we want to see your exhibit on uh, a French and Indian war. You know, take, take us to it with the camera. I, now I'm excited, I want Elon Musk, because I know my What's kids, that I would like my kids to talk to Elon Musk. Oh. Huh. I think especially now that, um, I, he's young and he's hip, so I know they'd be into that scene. Um, and he's, uh, he's pretty interesting as a person, and certainly what we're doing with SpaceX right now is, would be really a cool tie-in. And how do you, uh, how would that, if someone said, well, why Elon Musk? I mean, are you, do, you, do you teach space exploration or? Um, I think, which is you said, thinking beyond social studies, um, yeah. looking at, I'm actually in transition. Um, not, I'm not sure I'll be doing social oh. studies or just social studies next year. So I want to think more broadly. That would be an interesting one to, to go to because it's so current, but making so much history the Tesla side of it as well, you know, innovation. He, he would be interesting just to have him chat about innovation, I think. 
Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? Oh, Joe? Posted in the chat box. What about, <clears throat> excuse me, Greta Thunberg? Yeah, uh, that is, who, who did you say? Greta Thunberg, Thunberg? The... She's the young girl who is teaching everybody about climate change and it might be powerful to have another young person speaking with other kids and, you know, inspire them to stand up for what they believe or help them try to make a difference. Yeah. Huh. How about somebody in your community? I've been interested in the idea of just having students uh, talk to school board candidates um, to see if they can ask them some of the tough questions from their perspective that they'd want to know uh, before uh, elections are held. Yeah. So to piggyback off that, Neil, it's been interesting during remote learning to see how many high school students are now finally participating in school board meetings because they're all held remotely. And they're also being broadcasted on the Facebook, our, um, our Facebook page. So it, if the kids are following the high school Facebook page, they're getting alerts that there's a live video. So it's nice to actually see the high school students now participating and watching the school board meetings. And I think there's going to be a big shift in what happens with school boards if the kids are starting, especially the seniors, are starting to see like, what is actually happening happening during school board meetings um, and who's making the decisions and what kind of decisions are being made, especially during this time right now. Hmm. Elaine, you've got the global class and Jessica you work with elementary school teachers. Jessica didn't, she, I think she's gone, right? I'm still here. Yeah, there you are. Academic, what was the, I wrote down AC, but I forgot what the abbreviation stood for. Oh, um, academic support. Oh, support. So that, what does that really mean? What, what, what do you do in that regard? Um, just helping students with reading and math. Students, okay. Reading and math, a little different there. Hmm. Well, um, again, if, um, if there is anybody who chooses to venture forward into this area and uh, you have any degree of success, let me know. I'd love to feature it on um, Titan's Got Talent. I mean, we'll make an honorary Titan for, for, for the post. And uh, certainly any, anybody that pioneers out and ventures out, regardless of the result, gets a little recognition uh, there. I like to tell the stories. Um, and uh, other than that, I would su just suggest a CIL CILC for sure. If, if you have not yet had an opportunity, how many are, you, are familiar with Edutopias? Everybody familiar with that website? That is uh, George Lucas's website. Um, you know, George made his movies and then decided to come over into the realm of education. And I've been very impressed with his work um, and very impressed with Edutopia. I think it's a great, great resource, great articles up there. But that's all I've got for you. How are we doing on time, Joe? You have whatever you want for time. Well, I'm good. If you guys are good, if there's anything I can answer, it's, I will. And if not, uh, real pleasure again to see you all and be we give can go this ahead opportunity. And for, talk about, I will do the formal thank you, Peter. Um, and thank you again for coming in and hanging out with us um, on behalf of everybody who participated previously, who is here still right now, or who might watch this in the future. Thank you again for giving an hour, giving up your lunch. I we talked about that right when you got in, that it was lunchtime for you. Um, so thank you for giving up your lunch for us. 
My pleasure. I really appreciate the opportunity, as I said, to, to get ready for these kinds of things. Um, you just rack your brain, and then before you know it, um, you've moved it forward. You've moved it forward. So it's a presentation. There's better information in it today. I've taken a number of notes. I'm going to add those uh, better the next time around. The whole thing just continues. This new teaching and much appreciate. Thank you all.